um, goal of uh, static or dynamic scheduling is to have uh, CPI less than one. And the primary way to achieve that is to uh, reorder instructions uh, to reduce the number of interrupts. So we have discussed uh, make the, the, the uh, technique of dynamic scheduling. So, so here is a summary of uh, the major elements of a dynamically scheduled pipeline. You need a good branch predictor uh, to make sure that the later part of the pipeline works on useful instructions and minimizes wasted work. So otherwise, if you do not have a good predictor, you will be fetching wrong instructions most of the time. And you'll be doing wasteful work, which will have to be thrown away later. Second element is multiple issue. You must fetch, decode, select, and issue multiple instructions every cycle. And that's what is called a superscalar uh, processor. Third element is wake up logic. So this logic is, is some responsible for uh, waking up instructions that are waiting for values. Um, so it preserves data flow. And the, the implementation of the wake up logic is essentially a bank of comparators. Next one is selection logic, which essentially selects a subset of instructions that can execute now. And um, there could be two possibilities of selection. You could select in order, or you could select out of order instructions. Okay. So we'll, we'll look at both of these very soon. In fact, we have already looked at out of order selection. The only uh, constraint, the extra constraint for out of order selection is you need a priority mechanism, or often called a time, time breaker. For example, if you have uh, decided that you design your hardware such that um, in a cycle, maximum you can issue 10 instructions. Now, it could be possible that you have 20 instructions ready. Now, out of order selection, of course, doesn't impose any constraint on which instructions you can pick. You can pick any 10 of these. Okay. So there has to be a time breaking policy. Whereas in order already gives you a restriction so that you have to go in order. You cannot violate the order. Which means even if you have 20 different instructions at different places which are ready, you may be only able to select five of them. So we'll soon look at this one actually. It's a deconstruction of out of order selection. Much simpler, uh, lower performance. So essentially the idea here is that the selection logic obeys the issue constraints, such as available register file read force, memory read force, and function limits. Okay. So I, the example just I, I mentioned about this. 10 instructions maximum that comes from these constraints in the shape. Okay. Because 10 instructions would possibly mean that your register file code has 20 read ports. Okay. Memory read ports may be something depending, depending on how many of these 10 instructions can be memory operations and so on and so forth. And finally, you have uh, decoupled execution and commit. Okay. So this is very different from what we have discussed uh, for uh, single issue in order pipelines. Uh, that is, you execute an instruction. And then, after some time, the result will be written back to the register file or memory. So essentially, uh, this particular uh, logic preserves in order write back and store completion. So, so these are the major elements of uh, dynamic scheduling that we have discussed, um, which tries to achieve this goal, that is CPI as, as low as possible. Okay. So um, at, at each stage, if you, if, you, if you observe carefully, you're introducing certain constraints okay. for implementation purpose. For example, here, you're saying that I don't have an oracle predictor. I have a realistic predictor, which will make mistakes sometimes. Okay. That, will lower, that will actually increase your CPI by some amount. Right. Here, you're saying that I cannot really fetch, decode, and, and um, select and issue an infinite um, unbounded number of instructions. I have some limit there. That will further reduce, uh, increase your CPI. Here you're saying that I can wake up arbitrary number of instructions, but I cannot really select all of them for each one. So there also you're imposing certain limits. And here, of course, you're saying that um, I cannot really commit an unmodern number of instructions. Okay. There also you're imposing some limits. So all these taken together, along with your data flows, will give you some CPI, which is hopefully better than whatever we have discussed and whatever you're doing in your book. Right. Any question on this? This basic scheme of 
So this actually, I mean, this description abstracts away all the implementation details. How exactly you go and implement all these things? Okay, this is the basic algorithm. Okay, so um, this one also we have discussed. So just to uh, recap a little bit. Um, so when you are issuing multiple instructions in the cycle, ideally the CPI should go down by a factor equal to minimum of issue and commit rate, you know, steady state. Right? So how many instructions I can execute in the cycle, and how many instructions I can commit in the cycle. Minimum of these should decide by how much my CPI should go down compared to a single issue in order by Okay. So um, assuming full renaming, that is, suppose you have no name dependence, no false dependence, right? you have only true data flow dependence um, and, um, and a control flow. Uh, uh, so data flow and control flow will only limit the CPI. Okay. Right. Also there could be structural hazards, that is insufficient functional release, let's say. And there are two possible selection algorithms, in-order selection and out-of-order selection. This one we have already discussed. Okay, so let's take a look at this one, what really is in-order selection. So this is the simplest possible design of a superscalar processor. Uh, by the way, the, the term superscalar really means that you are executing multiple instructions in a cycle. That's what it really means. So um, in this case, what you do is you issue the instructions sequentially. Yeah. Um, so you scan the issue queue, stop as soon as you come to an instruction which cannot be executed now. Um, it, which could be possibly due to pending operands or insufficient function. So here's an example. Let's see what's happening here. So uh, these two are independent instructions. And let's assume that their operands are now ready. R5, R6, and R3 are ready already. Okay, all right. Uh, this one depends on add. Okay, all right. So it's clear that. Um, this one cannot execute together with this one. That's pretty obvious, okay. given this one. Okay. And um, these two are also independent. Okay, all right. So an out-of-order scheduler would actually pick these four instructions, except the red one, and would actually execute them in a cycle. An in-order scheduler would actually issue only these two in this cycle, because it cannot violate the order. In the next cycle, it will probably pick up these three and issue them. Okay. All right. See the difference here? Okay. So um, you cannot issue the last two, even though they are independent of the first. So that's what you do when you uh, do in order issue. And what do you gain by doing this? You can design in what terms? In what terms? So from this list, can you tell me what gets in this? Wake up logic gets simplified. Why? You still have to wake up the waiting instructions. So selection logic is not required. You just so basically. Well, the selection logic is the logic which picks instructions and stops at the first ready one. So it's a simpler logic. That that's what is going on. Right. What else? Do I need this one? In order commit or anything? Yes, so in selection logic, we are already choosing like this, so that uh -huh. they don't. Uh, so, so can I modify the registers immediately? So here we were actually putting the results back to the queue entry yes. and later moving it. Can I do it here? Can I uh, move R4 and R7 directly to registers immediately? Is that possible? Is that a bypass of the value? Whether it goes to extra file or keeps talking about it? I can? Anybody else? So intuitively it seems that in order issue should uh, read me off this particular logic of in order commit later. Is that right? So if the pipeline stages are not, uh, each instruction is not passing to uh -huh. yeah. No, let's assume they do. Let's assume they do. There's a single pipeline, let's say. Every instruction goes to that part. Yes, you're right. Otherwise, there will be problems. Yeah. Because I uh, essentially are talking about a uh, yeah. uh, completion problem. Yeah. Yeah. No, but let, let's not get into that. So different execute units. Right. Like right. So, so essentially, you're saying that 
In that case, whatever we have seen is a multi-cycle execution. Right? Some instructions may complete early and may write. No, let's let's not assume that. We have a single, let's say a simple five stage pipe or whatever, you know. Every instruction goes to the same pipe. Okay. The order of okay. The order of okay. All right. So, so essentially, you are saying that um, in the register file write port, I should have some mechanism to maintain the order in which they write. Okay. Is that understandable? For example, these two these two instructions could be writing both to R four. Okay. I must preserve this order when they write to the register file. Okay. Which makes sense. Anything else? Any other issue with this? They have time. Yes, but remember that instructions execute in order, which means if there was a branch before it, it has already executed. Okay. And I know the fate of it by now. You cannot put anything in the branch. No, you can say that I probably cannot execute anything together with the branch. That's what we only trying to say. Yes. True. Yes. Because anything that goes in parallel with the branch uh, may have a possibility of producing a wrong value and uh, corrupting the register file. That is true. Any other issues? Uh, the store and door also needs to be independent of them. Can't be figured out at the time of. Sure. Yes. So we follow the same protocol as we discussed. Yeah. They, here, the, here the things are much simpler because they will go in order. Okay. You know that the execution is in order. So the next, if there is a store and the next statement is a load, you can't figure out that this load is a independent or dependent. Right, so you are saying that if I have a store and a load, I cannot execute them in parallel in the cycle. That's what you're saying. Yes, agree. Right. Yeah, so we, we still have certain issue constants as they're coming out here. And we also have to maintain um, uh, register write port order uh, to, to detect write after write hazards. Uh, any problem with uh, write after read hazards? Can that create an issue? Right after read dependencies. Okay, all right. So, so the point is, point here is that it's indeed simpler. Okay, uh, it pretty much reads you off the the in order extra five stage for in order commit, provided you maintain certain uh, points that that you, you guys have uh, raised. Okay, and uh, here is an example of out of order issue. Uh, we have already discussed this also. Um, so. Um, Colors are hopefully clear, right? We have three colors here. Um, so um, depends on your test and how you see it. I'll call it a pink, uh, this, this particular color, okay? Um, so the pink instructions can go in the first cycle because they're all independent. And you can figure out why the rest cannot go. Uh, this one depends on the load. Uh, this one depends on the add. Uh, this is independent. Uh, this one depends on the XOR. This is also independent. Uh, this one depends on the add and um, this one depends on the shift. Uh, this one is independent. All right. Okay. The pink instructions are independent. They can go in a first cycle. All right. So that's that's the basic idea of out of order issue. I don't care about the order. Okay. Right. We have discussed it already. Um, the blue ones can go in the second cycle uh, because the black one still cannot go because I'm saying that there is a cache miss, which is essentially meaning that it, it's going to take a long time to complete. Okay, right? So these three instructions are arithmetic instructions, um, actually logic instructions. They will complete in a cycle term. Okay. Um, so their dependence can issue in the next cycle. Like this one can issue in the next cycle. This one can issue in the next cycle. Okay. So that's the second issue cycle. And finally, when the load completes, um, let's see. Okay, in the third cycle, this this can go uh, without any problem because uh, both its operands will get ready uh, from these two. Okay, all right. It needs twenty and nineteen. They come from here and here. And then finally, when the load completes, this will go, and in the next cycle, this will. Go. So that's the out of order issue. And then my commit logic will guarantee that they update registers in the order specified in this program, in this particular sequential order. Okay. That's the essence of, the essence of all the order. Okay, right? Clear? 
Any questions on this? Okay, so. Um, and we also discussed uh, the presence of this uh, right after read uh, problem, which you have to worry about, uh, as you can see here, right? So we said that the shift can issue in the second cycle, but you have to be sure that it doesn't overwrite R19, which is being consumed by the end instruction much later. Okay. And in order commit solves the problem. So because we'll make sure that 19 will not get written until all these instructions get a chance to write. So in order commit, we'll make sure that first R4 is written, then R5, then R10, then R26, then R20, then R27, then R19. Okay. So there's, there's no name dependence problem here if you, if, you, if you commit in order. Okay. But the downside is that you need space to buffer results, essentially. Okay. So you have to make sure that R19 is not made visible to the, to the other instructions. Okay, right. okay so um, often uh, people call dynamics scheduling um, also a form of speculative execution because the point here is that you are combining um, so so you can you can see it as as, as um, so if you go back to this list so often this part except the branch predictor uh, can be used independent of what's happening in the fetcher okay. whether you have a predictor or not you can liberally use this part of the logic Okay, so, so essentially you can say that I'll, I'll keep on fetching in order. Okay, no branch predictor. On a branch, whenever I observe a branch, I'll solve the predictor. Okay, I can still do this actually, even without a branch predictor. Nothing stops me from using all this logic. Okay. So that's that's the pure dynamic scheduling. There is no speculation. As soon as you introduce a branch predictor, you are bringing some speculation in the pipeline. You're now saying that there are certain instructions which are speculatively fetched, which may be actually on the wrong path. So eventually the branch predictors uh, predict prediction will be tested and I'll get to know whether the instructions are correct or not. Okay. So these two taken together is often called speculative execution. So um, that's just a different name of uh, what we have already discussed. So resolve control dependencies by predicting. Continue execution past predicted branches. That is, you not only fetch from predicted path, but also execute them if they're data independent. We have already discussed this also. Um, buffer results in some structure. This is called a reorder buffer or an active list, depending on the processor architecture. So, so active list is the term used by MIPS architectures. Otherwise, in most other processors, you'll see the term reorder buffer. Okay. This is essentially a separate structure which, um, which maintains the results of the instructions and the order of the instructions. Okay, all right. Um, allocated together with the issue queue entry. So in the issue queue entry, we put everything, the, the one that we saw. Here, I'm just decoupling a few fields from the issue queue entry, putting it in a separate structure called the order right. So essentially, it decouples the value field from the issue queue. That's all. Uh, typically, the issue queue is distributed among different types of functional units. These are known as reservation stations. Um, that's what we have discussed also. Eliminates unnecessary comparisons during wake up. For example, you could now have a partition between integer and floating point issue queues. Integer results will be broadcast only on the integer queue. The floating point results will be broadcast on the floating point queue and so on. Right? So you can save some of the comparisons. Because all to all comparison is actually not needed for all cases. And finally, you write or commit results, to register file or memory, only when an instruction comes to the top of the ROV. So ROV is a is an acronym used for the order buffer. So the order buffer is actually a FIFO queue. It maintains the instructions and it has a value field which stores the result produced by the instruction. And it will be drained in order. So that's essentially that's what we have discussed. It's just that I'm, I'm just introducing a new structure called ROB to decouple the value field from the issue queue um, and distributing the issue queue across functional units. Integer ALU have, will have an issue queue. For point ALU will have an issue queue. The load store, we need the cache, we have an issue to do. And the memory system, we have an issue to do. Any question? Is it clear? OK. So now, uh, just one small element that is left uh, in this architecture is something called register rename. We have already seen this. Okay. Essentially, what we were doing was that we are renaming our registers into issue queue slots. Okay. Right? So whenever instruction produces a register, 
Let's go back to this example. So here, essentially, R4 will be renamed to slot ID 0. All right? OK. R5 will be renamed to slot ID 1. R10 will be renamed to slot ID 2. OK, all right? So whenever slot ID 0 is done, it has a dependence on slot ID 0, it will be woken up. Okay. R4 is. So essentially, what I'm doing is I could actually now rewrite the instructions as follows. I could say load word ID 0, comma, 0 R6, add I ID 1, comma, ID 0, comma, 0 X20, and so on and so forth. I can actually translate the instructions to a different namespace. Right? Similarly, I could say and id2. Whenever I get a new instruction, I get a new target, I assign it to a new slot. Okay, right? id1 r19 xr id3 r2 r7 sub id4, id3, r2, etc. OK, all right? This is here, this, this renaming mechanism. I'm translating the registers from one namespace to another. The only thing to observe here is that it's a mix of two namespaces. OK, some of the names are coming from the register, architectural register. Some of the names are coming from my Q slot items. Okay. And there will be a table which would maintain this mapping. For example, whenever you do this, it will say R4 is now mapped to ID0. Okay. So the next instruction when it comes in, we'll look up the table and know that, oh, I should replace R4 by ID0. Okay. So that's how you do that in English. Okay. So that's what we have done till now. And here, since we have two namespaces, we had a problem. That is, we need to figure out whenever an instruction issues, where, where from it should read the value. Okay. All right. So there are two possible places it can read the value from. So for example, this instruction will read one value from the Q slot ID 1, the other value from register 19 in the register 5. And because of these two different sources of values, we had a problem that we had, we had to do a wake up cycle at the time of committing. Okay. To make sure, to, to let this instruction know that, for example, suppose this instruction, okay. Suppose this instruction's issue got delayed for some reason. For some reason, whatever it may be. And by the time it issues, this instruction has already written back. Okay. So when it writes back, it has to tell this instruction that, oh, now you should not take the value from ID0. You should actually take the value from R4. Okay, right? That has to be now changed back. Okay. So this becomes a huge problem. Because of and the, and the primary reason for this problem is that we have two namespaces mixed up here. Okay, we want one namespace. That's it. We want all values to come from a single namespace. So that's exactly uh, what today's processors do, and that's called register renaming. Um, so let's try to define a few terms. Uh, is the problem clear? Any question before I move on? Okay. So registers visible to the compiler are called logical or architectural registers. For example, um, 32 in, uh, in number for MIPS, the one that you're using uh, for your homework. Uh, there are eight for x86. Okay. Um, and this is fixed by the instruction set architecture. That is how much, how many registers should, made, should be made visible to the compiler or the program. program. And there are physical registers inside the processor. Okay. Um, usually today, it is much larger in number and not visible to the compiler. However, the requirement is that your physical register file size should be at least as large as the logical register file size. Right. So that in the minimum case, you should be able to have a one-to-one -one mapping from one logical register to one physical register. And that's what um, the processor you're using for your homework actually does. It has 32 logical registers. It has 32 physical registers. Okay. And there's always a fixed one-to-one -one mapping from a logical register to a physical register. Okay. But today's processors actually have much larger number of physical registers uh, inside the processor, which are not visible to the compiler. And if, if you have that, essentially then you have to establish the mapping. And the mapping actually changes over time. Which logical register maps to which physical register actually keeps on changing. And that's exactly the algorithm that 
that defines the register in any. The destination logical register of every instruction is assigned a new physical register now, just like this, except of, except except uh, assigning uh, a Q slot ID. I'll pick up a free physical register and give it to the instruction target. The dependence is tracked based on the namespace of physical registers only. There is no, no Q slot ID namespace. Right. So MIPS R10K has 32 logical and 64 physical registers. Intel Pentium 4 has 8 logical and 128 physical registers. Today's Intel processors have many more physical registers. Okay. So we'll see exactly what it means to have more physical registers, why you would want that, and so on. So let's revisit our last example, and let's see how renaming works. So let's assume that there are 64 physical registers, um, and this is the currently already renamed registers. Okay, all right. So R6 currently points to physical register 54, R19 points to P38, R2 points to P0, R7 is P20, R5 is P3, R6 is P20. So there will be a table which will maintain these maps. So I'll have a table for MIPS, I'll have a table with 32 entries. Actually 31, because R0 is actually fixed. Okay, it's hardware to zero. So in this case, for example, your, uh, let's see, R2, so this, so this row is for R2, it will basically hold zero, which means that currently any instruction requiring R2 should read physical register zero, all right? And etc. So the first instruction comes, it has a target R4, okay, so it should get a new register. Which register should it get? So there is a free list of registers. Okay. There is a big vector maintained, which tells you which register is free. I pick up the first register, which is free. So let's suppose that it's P15. Okay. Right. So R4 gets renamed to P15. Okay. And then the instruction finds that R6 is the source of the register. So it looks up the map table, finds that R6 is currently mapped to P54. So it gets renamed to this. So when the instruction will finally issue and execute, it will go and read P54 to get the value and put the result in P15. Okay. Right. So the next instruction comes. It, it has R4 as a source, looks up the table, finds that R4 is renamed to P15. So it changes to P15 and assigns a new register to R5. P5. Right. And the process continues. Now you can see that the registers which had a war problem now get two different names. That problem actually goes away. So this instruction will read from P38 because at this point R19 was mapped to P38. And here this instruction will get a new register for R19, which is say P40. Here it cannot be P38. Why is that? Well, it's not about the hazard, it's just that P38 is not available at this point. It has already been allocated to a register. So it's, we'll soon see how to recycle registers. Okay. Right. So there'll be a mechanism where by will actually recycle the registers. Okay. But currently, the point is that whenever something gets renamed to a physical register, that physical register is occupied. Okay. A subsequent instruction cannot use that register until it is freed. Okay. And we'll see when an instruction, when a, when a register gets freed. So it's a basic algorithm, okay? Okay. It's very simple. Yes. Why is the R27 become a uh, Yeah, so you assign it to a new register. Yeah. So every target gets a new register. Okay, and the new register is the one which is free. Out of many free registers, you pick one. Okay. Right? So uh, does this example tell you that um, you probably need at least one more register, one more physical register than the number of logical registers. If you, if you had exactly same, okay, would I make any progress actually? I wouldn't, right? Because at any point in time, all registers would probably be mapped to something. I get a new instruction, nothing is free. I cannot read really anything. So to make more progress, I need at least one extra physical register. So we'll sort of formalize this notion that uh, what exactly, how it how it relates to execution time and performance. Any question on that, Lord? Okay, yeah. 
All right. So branch instructions don't have a target. So they don't get a new register. They only rename their sources. So R19 becomes P45, because P45 was assigned R19 here. And R20 is taken from here, which is P8. R20 was renamed to P8. But there is nothing, there is no new register assigned to branch. So you just rename the sources. So this one now makes sure that everything is in a single namespace. And instruction issues, it knows where to read from the value. It reads the value from there, and that's it. Okay. So here is another example how um, renaming solves the problem of write after write hazard. So here are two instructions that write to the same register R5. So in this instruction, R5 will get renamed to some register, say P50. And here it will get renamed to some other register, let's say P45, whatever is free. Okay. Right. So now they can actually execute concurrently. They will write to two different registers. So now it is safe to issue them in parallel uh, because they are actually independent. Okay. It is just the compiler, uh, due to shortage of registers, architectural registers, had to introduce the right after the right hand. So essentially what I'm saying here is that, well, actually, you could ask the question that um, since the compiler was forced to do this, why not expose all the registers to the compiler? Right? Why do you have this complicated hardware inside to do the reading? If the compiler of the registers, let it do it, do a better job of register location, right? What do you think? Why is it done in this way? Is the question clear? Right? The scheduling is happening in the Right. Okay. So what I'm saying is that see, the, what I'm trying to say is why are we doing the name? Because we want to get rid of the name detail. Right? That's the only part. Okay. And why do we have name dependencies? Because the compiler was probably short of registers. That's why you had to introduce these name dependencies. Like here, you would very well ask, why the compiler choose R19 here? It could have chosen a different register, right? And the reason is that probably didn't have any register. Okay. It figured out that R19 is available. It just picked up R19 and allocated the value here. Okay. So if you give it, give it more registers, it should do a better job. Why is it done in this way? Why Intel processors are stuck with eight logical registers forever? Sorry, say it. You don't need to know, but you can expect that the compiler will definitely do a better job, given more registers. There may still be name dependencies. It's not guaranteed that all name dependencies will go away. But probably it will be so low in number that it doesn't matter anymore. But it's never done. It will not be done ever. Why is that? Instructions in architecture had to change. Um, Sorry? Backward compiler. Yes. So the, so the binaries that are compiled today will not work tomorrow as soon as you do this. Okay. Yes. Sorry? Would register still be available? Yes, encoding is going to change, right? Yes. You have to recompile your all, you know, all applications, okay. which is possible. Sorry? Say No, no, no. Here's the problem. You have bought a Microsoft Office suit, which is compiled for yesterday's x86 ISA. Microsoft will issue a new license to you, actually, to all the customers with a new mind register. It's a huge headache for the software industry. So it's, a, it's, a, it's primarily a business angle. Okay. Why this is not done? Theoretically, there is no problem. We could do it. So just to hide this problem, processors are doing it inside uh, in the pipeline. Okay. Okay. Um, although, although I must mention, actually, uh, AMD 
uh, took, a, took an interesting step when they designed Octave. Okay. They actually introduced 16 logical registers. And they showed that it actually helps. So, of course, they, they, it came with a rider that um, if you want to make use of this, you have to recompile your binaries. But your old binaries will continue to work with lower power. That's all. So, they, of course, they did it cleverly. <coughs> Okay, all right. So, um, register renaming maintains a map table that records a logical register to physical register map. After an instruction is decoded, its logical register numbers are available. The renamer looks up the map table to find mapping for the logical source registers of this instruction, assigns a free physical register to the destination logical register, and records the new mapping. So, that's the renaming procedure. So, how does the pipeline look like? Uh, so these are my pipeline stages. I'm not saying really that each stage is a cycle. Each stage might be multiple cycles. Okay. So fetch decode, then rename allocate. Uh, so in the rename allocate stage, you rename your logical register, source registers, assign a new physical register to the destination. You allocate ROV entry, you allocate issue queue entries. Uh, then you do a selection issue whenever the instruction is ready, eventually it will be ready. Then you read the register file. So when you read this, you read the physical registers, of course. Okay, all right. Um, then you execute, look up memory if needed, and then retire commit. We'll sort of come to this particular stage because now the question is what this stage is really doing now. Because previously we were actually copying values from ROV to the register file. Now that, that need is gone because I can execute, I can write the register immediately. Okay, because each instruction now gets a different register. So there is no question of a write after write hazard or write after read hazard. Okay, I can write the register immediately. So we'll see what that particular stage does. So um, fetch decode, rename, allocate are in order stages. Um, each handles multiple instructions every cycle, meaning that here you go sequentially, fetch a bunch of instructions, decode all of them, rename all of them, allocate all of them. All right. <coughs> Select um, issue, register file, read, execution, memory lookup are out of order. They can go can execute instructions as and when they become ready. You don't have to obey the order. All right? An instruction directly updates the destination register file, uh, destination physical register contents on completion. It doesn't wait till commit. Okay. We'll soon argue that this is correct. Okay. Although intuitively it is correct because every instruction gets a new physical register. So there is no question of a conflict. And also there is no question of uh, uh, right after uh, read hazard. Um, yeah, so out of order register update that happens actually now, and you'll have to argue why is it correct. So we'll, we'll soon come to that point. And retire is again in order. So by the way, okay, so this is a technical term often used for from it, uh, that is an instruction retire. So which means that it was born when it was fetched, and finally it's done when it starts with retire. Okay, right? um, <clears throat> so retire is again in order, but multiple instructions may retire each cycle. Um, and register write back is not part of this anymore. Right. It happens as part of the execution stage. Um, when an instruction issues, it broadcasts its destination physical register ID to all instructions in the issue queues, and that's essentially the, the wake up logic. So every instruction will compare its source physical registers with the destination of the broadcast uh, register. So, for example, here, um, when this instruction issues, um, it will broadcast P15 to all the instructions, and uh, this guy will have a match, um, and we know that now the next cycle probably it can issue. In this case, probably it cannot issue in the next cycle because of loading the locks. We have to probably wait for a few more cycles. Uh, similarly, when this instruction issues, uh, it will broadcast P62, okay, and this instruction will match its source, and we'll actually wake up and know that next cycle it can go. So that's how the wake up happens. <clears throat> Any question? Okay. So uh, with register renaming, uh, what does speculative execution now look like? Commit is much simpler because there is no need to transfer values from ROV to register file. Uh, in fact, no computed value is stored in ROV. Now the ROV only stores a few state bits about the instruction um, and just maintains the order. It's still a paper key. All right? 
uh, branches update predictors, uh, branch target buffers, and return address stacks when they commit. Um, killed instructions just drain out. So these are the instructions that are on the wrong path, later discovered uh, because of misprediction. So they just get, get marked as killed, and the ROV will just remove them from the, from the, from the processor. Also, stores write to memory at this time. Uh, store queue or speculative store buffer holds a value. So uh, remember that we said that we distribute the issue queue into functional units. Okay, right? So memory subsystem will get two issue queues. One is a load queue, other one is a store queue. Okay. So the load instructions will go in the load queue, store instructions will go in the store queue. And the store queue will also have the value that it needs to store. Okay. So when the store comes to the head of the ROV, the value will be moved from the store queue to memory. And finally, the ROV entry is recycled so that it can now be reused. Um, and remember that the issue queue entries are recycled when the instruction issues. So they are issued, they are recycled much earlier than the ROV entry. So the ROV entry is held to go back to the pipeline here. So the ROV entry gets allocated in the allocate pipe stage. And it remains held until the instruction moves to this stage. Okay, right? That's a pretty long time, actually. Whereas an issue queue entry is allocated here in the allocate stage, but gets freed as soon as it issues. Okay, because there is no need for this issue queue entry anymore. The instruction is not issued. Right? So issue queue entries actually get remain held for a shorter period, whereas ROV entries are held for a very long period. Okay. <coughs> So what, what is the implication of that? Can you infer anything of the relative sizes of these two things? ROV and issue queue entries? The ROV and the issue queues. ROV entries remain occupied for longer periods of time. Whereas issue queue entries remain occupied for shorter time. So which one could be bigger, ROV or the issue queues? ROV, right? That's pretty obvious. <clears throat> okay. Um, branch misprediction recovery needs to restore the register map. So we have talked about this. This is a restore flow checkpoint. Okay. The same thing continues. Whenever a branch is renamed, you take a checkpoint of the, of the map table. And if it is mispredicted, you just restore the map table. Um, in addition to marking all instructions on the wrong path as skipped. Okay. So these are these instructions. Branches when going through renaming checkpoint the, the register map. Remember that these are not the values. This is only the map that is checkpointed. Okay. So here, for example, when this branch instruction shows up, when it is renamed, it will only checkpoint the map. Map meaning that it remembers that at this point of time, R19 was holding the map P45. Uh, R27 was holding P19 and so on and so forth. The value of P45 is not checkpointed. Okay. Value of P45 can be whatever. Okay. Doesn't care. So we'll soon argue why it is correct because it's not very obvious that um, that we're not checkpointing the value of P45. We're only checkpointing the map that R19 corresponds to P45. Okay. So could it be that some instruction actually updates P45 in the wrong way? Okay, and later, of course, I cannot recall if it does okay. The only observation here to make is why it is correct is that any instruction that comes, let's suppose that this branch was actually misprinted. Okay. Any instruction that comes after the branch will not be allocated P45. It will be allocated some other, other register. Okay. So P45 can only be updated by this instruction. Okay. There cannot be anything else updating P45. So you don't need to checkpoint the values. You only need to checkpoint the map. Right? Second, of course, uh, we are continuously making an implicit assumption that there is an algorithm which recycles registers in the same way. We'll come to that soon. Okay. The recycling algorithm of registers. OK. Um, so this one. The implication of this is that, uh, this one also we talked about, limits the number of outstanding branches. Because it depends on how many checkpoints you can accommodate. Uh, if your processor can accommodate 100 checkpoints, then your processor should be able to support 100 unresolved outstanding branches. Okay. 
in flight. Right? Usually the number is much smaller than 100. Okay. A few tens of batches. Any question? OK, so the last point. How do we recycle the resistance? Any suggestion? When should I? OK, let's go back to that. So when should I free P15? When can another instruction use P15? When ADI has finished. Do I know that there is no instruction in the future that will be needing P15? Maybe there is someone writing to Arthur. Uh, no, why? Sorry, say it. Do I have any such situation here? Okay, I don't have any common target here. Okay, so you're saying that if there is an instruction which writes to R4, when? So an instruction now has several, you know, it, it, it's not really a point in it, right? It, it spans over a certain cycles. It is fetched. So right to that. You have an instruction which writes to R4. Okay? So when the other instruction begins to the commit state, mm -hmm. at that time you can be asking. Okay, all right. So, so essentially what it's saying is that um, let's suppose an instruction here writes to R4. All right? So at that time R4 will be given a new map, which is some register. Okay, whatever the that, that register is free, whatever whichever register is free at that point. And he's saying that when this instruction finally commits, I'm guaranteed that P15 can be recycled, which makes sense. Because from now on, R4 has a new committed name, okay, right? whatever was assigned here. So R4 to P15 map now must expire. Okay. And I should be able to reuse P15 for some other register. Make sense? Does everybody see that it's a conservative policy? I could have done better. Why? So, like this R code is not used for a long while. Uh -huh. We can just expire uh, this P15 for a long time. Other registers. Right. So, do you see any difficulty of doing that? You're right. Yes, that's precisely the problem. Why it is conservative. Do you see how, how to do that? Let me ask this question. I really cannot see the future. That is the problem. So what do I need to determine? I need to determine if beyond a certain instruction, P15 is dead. There won't be any instruction needing P15. Right? That's what I need to determine. Okay. If I had a way to determine that, I could have done that actually. Okay, right? Yeah. So um, there are uh, there are research papers which have looked at this problem. Uh, you can actually um, design predictors which can predict uh, Last touch to a certain register. So that's actually sorry. Show that information. Show that information. Is it a static information? Starting from a point, you could follow different control paths, right? And on different control paths, the register may become data at different points. Yeah, you could remember the whole thing. On this path, the register becomes dead here. On this path, yeah, of course. If you have enough storage, you could remember the whole thing. Yes? So when one instruction wake up the other instruction, yes. so we can um, check, we can check this tree. Mm -hmm. What all is the instructions are getting wake up? OK, all right. So whenever all the instructions are being committed, uh -huh. wake up instruction, then it's safer to use uh, it. No. Does everybody see? So what he is suggesting is that when um, when this instruction issues, it will broadcast P15. So all the instructions waiting in the issue queue will, will compare. And you know who are the instructions waiting for P15. And when all of them actually uh, have committed, there you can. No further wake up on the how do you know? There, there will not be any further need for P15. It's not about the wake up. There may be some instructions which is not yet fetched, actually, which may require R4. So yeah, so as such, um, it's not an easy problem. Okay. So
which is why today's processor actually do what he has suggested. Um, we wait until R4 is over to and that instruction when commits, I know that the new math has been committed. So I can uh, now free PPT, okay. Now, the easy way to do that, so, so how do you really implement it? That's what the question is. And the difficulty is that when this instruction commits, you cannot really say that, well, I look up the map table and find out what R4 maps to and I'll free that register. That would be wrong. Okay. Because R4 now points to some totally different register. Because by the time this instruction commits, there may be many more instructions in the pipeline which already have overwritten R4. Okay. So how do you really free P15? How do you find out actually? That P15 is the one to be freed when this instruction finally commits that uses R4. That, that overwrites R4. Yes. Yes, exactly. So you remember in the ROB, so when you rename this instruction, you you when you assign R4 a new map, you look up the table there and find that oh R4 now maps to P15 at this point. You just remember 15 in your ROB entry. Okay, and when you finally commit, you mark P15 as free. Okay, so that's my register recycling uh, algorithm. So now it should tell you why I don't need to checkpoint values for, for branches, okay? Because there is no way P45 is going to be freed, okay, and going to be reassigned before this branch commits. Because any instruction that overrides P45 will have to come later, okay? And it cannot commit actually, all right? <coughs> okay, so um, yeah. Uh, so the, if the renamer runs out of physical registers, the pipeline stalls until at least one register is available. So physical registers must be recycled. When is it safe to free a physical register? We have just discussed. Um, what about wrong path instructions? So yeah, so that's an interesting question actually. So um, think about this instruction. This one, right? So here uh, R12 gets mapped to P59, okay, all right? And uh, the pipeline continues moving. Eventually, you figure out that this branch was mispredicted, which means this instruction should not have been fetched, actually. So now, what do you do with P59? Why does P59 get free? To be free now only, right? Does everybody see that? As soon as this instruction uh, comes to the head of the ROB in the killed state, of course, I can free P59 immediately because it's actually a non-committed map. Okay. So there is no problem in freeing P59 and using it because whatever value that was put in P59 is a garbage value. I can ignore it completely. I can ignore it and ignore it. Okay. So um, more physical registers means uh, more in flight instructions. That should be now clear actually because as soon as I run out of registers, my pipeline has to stall. Okay. If I have more registers, I can keep on renaming registers and even I can keep on moving my pipeline, okay, right? And that also opens the possibility of more parallelism. So number of registers have a great connection with how much ILP you can uh, expose. Okay. Uh, but cannot make the register file very big because there are downsides. It takes time to access as it gets bigger, okay? You know, there's a, there's a thumb rule that you have to remember that is uh, smaller and faster and usually bulky structures are slower. Right? So as you make it bigger and bigger, it's going to be slower and slower. Okay. So you start using CPI uh, uh, in some other place. Okay. And also it burns power, which is very important. Large structures usually very energy. What is that? Is there a relationship between ROB size and register file size? So, okay, so today register file size means the number of physical registers. <clears throat> what do you think? Should there be or can they be sized independently? Uh, what is less than equal to the ROB size is less than equal to the register size. Why? Mapping of all these registers. Uh -huh. Mapping of all these physical registers. So at max we can map all these physical registers. We are at the, the when we are using all these registers, we are mapping for all these you are saying ROB size is less than equal to physical register size. Right? Sorry? All the definitions are 
write right okay All the instructions have the same destination register. Yeah. Then I'll be actually recycling the registers, right? Quite frequently. Like the time of commit. The yeah. so worst case would actually be that okay, all right, fine. So what are suggesting? So less than equal to? What is it? So you're saying that? You're right. So you're saying that as many physical registers I have. I could, I should be able to rename those many instructions. So which way is the inequality? What makes sense? Sorry? Less than equal to. Yes, because um, if I have a bigger ROB, some of the slots will remain empty. Right. I cannot rename it in the worst case. Can I tighten this a little bit? If I tell you that I have n logical registers, one less than sorry, one less than n minus one. N minus one is what? What is n minus one? No, no. So this one we have already. Uh, so you're saying ROB size cannot be bigger than n minus one. Why? It's independent of this size, isn't it? I have n logical registers. Yes? Two times. How do you arrive that? So basically, like, you are using two, uh, two names for single register. Like, if a register is using, say, R4, say, add is using R4 as a source, and then a load instruction is using R4 as a R4 register. So we can we have to use two names for that. Right. So we can't we won't use more than two names for a single logical. It could be three, four names, right? Because register will not be until that instruction is committed. You don't know when it's going to be. But then on after the load instruction you would use the same name for uh, the same physical register. No, so you're saying that there are two instructions with the same target. No, no, no. No, okay, sorry. Yes. So one instruction is using one instruction is using, uh, say, one as source, one as uh, source, so it has one uh, mapping, we are using one name for that, and uh, uh, one, uh, one is using it as a destination, so we use no, one. No, which comes first? So the destination one is after the first. Okay, fine. Mm -hmm. So we have to use uh, second name for this. Right, okay. And uh, we, should, we, we shouldn't require more than these two names. What if you get another instruction that is in the same register as us, you can another name? Only one that commits. You don't know what it is. By then you have 20 more incarnations of the same register. So if I have an ROB size, ROB size should be? Is it? saying is that the minimum number of physical registers occupied is going to be n at any point in time. Register file should be greater than n. Register file size should be greater than n. Okay. So we have that we have already discussed, right? That RF size should be greater than or equal to n plus 1 to make forward progress. Okay. So can somebody put n on some side here? So I have already n physical registers occupied. Now I start fetching instructions and putting it down. Can I just say it like this? N are always occupied. Whatever I have left with, only that much I can allocate in the worst case. Right? Okay. Of course, eventually they will get freed, but I don't know when they are going to be freed. So I, I should not have my ROB size bigger than this. 